Okay, I started it and also you are the host from now on. Okay. And I think slides are also visible. Very good. Perfect. Uh, I need to do one more thing. I'm sorry. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome to today's lecture of computer architecture. Um, I hope you enjoyed the uh, Rohammer story in the last Friday and the papers about uh, showing you the cutting edge in Rohammer research and in general DRAM pre-disturbance research yesterday. Um, it was a bit of a stretch and uh, we rushed at the very end yesterday. So I hope to uh, find uh, more opportunities to talk about those papers in the future. But if you're uh, curious about them, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. Also, uh, in the slides, you can find uh, a lot of uh, uh, long talks of uh, uh, those papers. So today, uh, we will cover uh, lecture eight, data retention and memory refresh. And um, I just before starting this, I'd like to remind you that uh, the homework one is due today. And uh, please uh, remember that, you know, uh, you have some paper reviews and some questions that you need to answer in homework one. And um, the paper reviews deadline is not today. It's in at the end of the semester. So you have time to review those papers. And we uh, highly encourage you to do like as many reviews as you can so that you can collect some bonus points as well. And it will give you a better and deeper picture of uh, the state of the art today. So let's begin with this lecture. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, we will start with a recall of the uh, purpose of this lecture. So we want to have you uh, a good understanding of how a computer system works underneath the um, software layer and um, how the decisions we make in hardware uh, affect uh, your software, uh, the user, the programmer, uh, uh, and how important they are, right? And uh, we also want to uh, make you comfortable to make uh, design optimizations uh, such that you, can, uh, you, you will cross the boundaries uh, across different layers of system components so that uh, you, uh, in, in future systems, we will, have, uh, we will have much more efficient, reliable, and high performance systems. Um, so today we will talk about DRAM refresh. So this is uh, quite this is tightly coupled with the Rohammer talks we had in the last two lectures, but this is something more fundamental, and this is uh, also uh, this is a longer history compared to Rohammer. Um, so, just a bit of a background. I'm not sure if you need it anymore. Uh, you have uh, in your system this processor die here, right? So this is a typical multi-core chip. You have like four cores. Those cores have their own um, private caches and they also have a shared cache and there's a DRAM interface here. And externally you have the uh, DRAM module here. Uh, it doesn't have to be a module like this. It can be some chips soldered on your motherboard, uh, but it's external uh, in traditional systems. Uh, uh, and this is a photo from AMD Barcelona. Okay, uh, when we look at inside the DRAM chip, we have an array of these cells. Basically, we have a capacitor here and a transistor here. And uh, it, it stores the data here in terms of some uh, charge, right? And uh, we actually put many of these cells next to each other. And we, we put a, a horizontal line here that we call the word line. When we assert this word line, it essentially enables the uh, transistor to conduct uh, the capacitor to the bit line. And uh, by reading this bit line, uh, we uh, access data, or when we, write, when we want to write some data inside, we put, um, we put some charge on this bit line. And when, uh, if this uh, transistor is enabled and uh, the bit line is conducted to the capacitor, uh, you will basically put some charge on the capacitor, close this, and hope that the charge remains here for some time. And uh, do you think it remains for a very long time? 
So the answer is not so long. Uh, it, it, it can store data for some time in the order of milliseconds based on the specifications. We will go uh, dive deep into those uh, today in today's lecture. And uh, uh, basically you need to uh, once in a while access this capacitor and refresh the charge stored there. Um, and uh, in a typical DRAM chip, we have tons of thousands of these rows. So you have uh, many DRAM cells. Okay. So uh, I already said that DRAM capacitor charge leaks over time and the memory controller needs to refresh each row periodically um, so that we can restore the charge back and we can uh, make sure that the data is intact over there. Um, so basically what we do is we activate each row every n milliseconds. So uh, this, uh, this is some like periodic operation. It's, it's a, a type of maintenance operation you need to perform while you're working with DRAM chips. And a typical period is 64 milliseconds. This is true for um, DDR3 and DDR4 chips, for example. Um, uh, if you go to high temperatures, this 64 milliseconds uh, goes down to 32 milliseconds. And if you go to newer technologies, it already goes down to 32 milliseconds for cooler temperatures as well. So it is something you need to perform quite often. And uh, of course, there are some downsides of refresh. So any guesses? Yeah, exactly. What else? Definitely. Yeah, I guess those are the two main things. Uh, so uh, energy consumption increases because you need to move charge. So charge leaks, you need to put more charge. It means that you need to put more power onto those uh, rails, right? And uh, there is performance degradation because you're making the whole bank uh, uh, not um, unavailable, unavailable so that you cannot serve any requests while this refresh operation is going on. And uh, it also hurts the quality of service and uh, hurts the predictability of uh, your memory request latency. And uh, yeah, refresh rate limits the DRAM capacity scale now. We will uh, see how it happens uh, in a little while. So uh, let's uh, talk about some like extreme cases. Let's, let's assume that, so uh, I think it's obvious uh, and does not require any motivation today that we want uh, very large capacity in our memories, right? So that we can uh, handle really large uh, data structures. We can process big data. We don't have to go to disk often. We don't have to fetch packets from the network often. Everything is DRAM. Like the whole Google database is in DRAM, for example. That would be really good, right? Um, let's say we want to have like a very high capacity in our DRAM chips uh, in here, like eight exabytes. Uh, so, I'm, I'm just throwing some numbers here, but this slide will not make the uh, calculation. So I will ask you to do that as some like exercise uh, in, in, by yourself. So assume that we have a row size of eight kilobytes. Uh, and uh, so how many rows do we have here? It's basically like the ratio of this number to this number, right? So two to the 50 rows you have here. So you, you need to refresh that many rows uh, at, uh, with some time period, right? And how many refreshes can happen in 64 millisecond? So I think you cannot answer this question without knowing like how much time uh, it takes to perform a refresh. I can give you a ballpark number saying that, okay, refreshing one row takes around like 15 nanoseconds. So you can calculate how many refresh operations you can perform in 64 milliseconds, right? And then based on that, you can see if this is feasible or not. And uh, what is the total power consumption, energy consumption uh, that we uh, uh, spend for this DRAM refresh? Um, so these are all like important questions when we try to scale up the DRAM capacity because this is an essential maintenance operation we cannot get rid of. And this is an animation of a leaky DRAM cell. 
So it's, uh, yeah, it just keeps leaking and you need to keep putting more water in it, right? So it's just like some real life example of that. Um, okay, so I will just like uh, take a little break here and talk about uh, some uh, uh, recent papers. And uh, the, my, my goal here is to show you that how important is DRAM leakage. Uh, so uh, this ISCA is uh, considered the best top conference or one of the top conferences in our field. Uh, it's International Symposium of Computer Architecture. So they had the uh, 15th one uh, this year and they had a, a, a session for uh, recognizing some papers uh, that are published in the last 25 years. Uh, as, and they, they asked, they called for some retrospective papers. And uh, this is one of the papers that we will talk about this paper today. Um, uh, so you can find, you can see that, you know, ISCA recognized this paper as uh, uh, one of those like uh, papers in the shortlist. And uh, this basically uh, performs, uh, refreshes in a heterogeneous way to uh, reduce the uh, performance and energy overhead of those refresh operations. And there's another work here that analyzes the data retention failures. It was also recognized uh, in this issue. And um, uh, this is the paper that we keep talking for the last uh, six hours of this lecture, let's say. Uh, this is a paper that was published in ISCA 14 that showed the uh, raw hammer for the first time uh, in a uh, wide range of systems. So um, uh, this was also recognized. So these are just some screenshots. So uh, uh, we have this in the slides to motivate you to read it. It's really a short read. Uh, it's a good weekend read as well. So uh, uh, Professor Mutlu wrote uh, these like two page papers, uh, each of them. Uh, so they're basically telling the story of how these papers published and with what motivation uh, they started working on these and what kind of results they got and uh, what, what, what was the impact of these papers over all these years. Um, I hope uh, you will take a look at these. Uh, it's, it's, it's really nice to read and it's, it's inspiring as well. Okay, let's go back to the DRAM, DRAM refresh overhead. So uh, we were talking about the performance uh, overhead, right? Uh, or as you said, it's like, uh, it reduces the memory bandwidth. So it, uh, I guess um, you can also measure that, but uh, when you look at the overall system performance, it's, I guess, easier to relate. Uh, relate with. So uh, on the x-axis, you can see like uh, uh, the device capacity increases. And on the y-axis, you uh, see like the percentage of time spent for refreshing, right? Um, actually, this is a bandwidth analysis in a sense. So uh, uh, this paper was published in 2012. And at that time, they had chips as like 2 gigabit, 4 gigabit, 8 gigabit. And they, uh, uh, they had a, a, a they had a projection for the larger capacity chips. And this is basically a very, uh, it's, it's essentially a very basic calculation that we had in the previous slide. Uh, you can uh, easily see that if you scale in the way that we scale in this region, when you reach to like 64 gigabit capacity chips, uh, you will spend almost half of your time only for this maintenance operation. So you have a DRAM chip over there, but it's not available for half of the time. And when you look at the energy, uh, it's also like you spend half of your energy, basically, uh, doing the refresh, uh, uh, basically, yeah. So how do we solve this problem? Uh, so we have an observation here. All the RAM rows are refreshed every 64 milliseconds. And we need to ask a question. This is a research question, right? This is a result of some critical thinking. And we need to ask, do we need to refresh? <laughs> all rows every 64 milliseconds. We are only refreshing these all rows at 64 milliseconds, only because the, this uh, specification tells us to do so, the manufacturers uh, tells us to do so, but uh, uh, it's, it's really important actually to understand what is our margin here. Are we being like too conservative or like, even like we should question is 64 milliseconds enough? 
should we refresh them more frequently one, right? So we need to understand the device characteristics. And uh, if we knew what happened underneath inside the DRAM cells, uh, we can expose this information to the upper layers so that the upper layers can uh, make use of this information and they can uh, uh, make this overall system much more efficient, right? We can reduce the performance and energy overheads. We can improve quality of service. Okay, so what happens inside us? This is some experimental data uh, that you can find in radar paper and in the other uh, characterization papers as well that I showed. Um, so this is all of your DRAM chip. And when you uh, do the characterization of this DRAM chip, and see how frequently you need to refresh a cell. Um, this is not really a, a physical uh, layout of that, of course. Uh, these rows are like just like spread across, um, but this is just a cartoonish uh, distribution uh, here, right? So you can see that that tiny bit of cells in this red portion needs refresh every 64 or 128 milliseconds. And for this yellow part, um, uh, sorry, to, to correct, uh, these, these red ones um, observe data retention bit flips between six, 64 and 128 milliseconds. So you need to refresh them every 64 milliseconds. So for this yellow part, they uh, do not uh, experience data retention errors uh, below 128 milliseconds, but they observe like between this 128 and 256. So you can actually refresh them every 128 milliseconds and you're safe. And for the rest of them, if you just like uh, refresh them at every 256 milliseconds, you will not see any data retention with Philips. So this is the real characteristic of the chips that they tested at that time. So it doesn't seem like it's really necessary to refresh the everything every 64 milliseconds. So why do we have such a profile? It's because uh, manufacturing is not perfect, and uh, uh, we don't have all the DRAM cells exactly the same, uh, exactly have the same physical characteristics in the DRAM chip. Uh, it's it's because of this imperfections in the manufacturing process, and there's always some variation in like different types of uh, different parts of chips. You see different characteristics, and some as a result, some cells are more leaky than the others. And when you basically uh, need to define a refresh rate, you need to account for the worst cases, right? You need to set it based on the weakest cell you have so that you will not see any bit flips. So you will guarantee the user that uh, this chip is reliable. And uh, this whole thing is called uh, an, uh, uh, an uh, artifact of manufacturing process variation in the sense of DRAM retention time. But you can see in other characteristics as well, this manufacturing process variation has a huge impact as uh, we showed uh, yesterday in, in that raw hammer characterization paper as well. Okay, uh, so there's an opportunity here, right? Uh, we can take advantage of this profile and we can assume that we know the retention time. Uh, it's not like we can assume, okay. Let's assume. We know the retention time of each row exactly. Um, so if we know, what can we do with this information? So uh, any ideas? By the way, I keep talking, but uh, if you guys have questions, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a very straightforward idea, right? It's, it's really good. And uh, the second question, who do we expose this information to? Like, so we have this information, we have this idea. So who will implement this idea inside the system? I guess uh, we can send it to memory control. Memory control is responsible of refreshing rows. It can do that. And how much information do we need to expose? So that's a bit hard, right? So uh, we need to find out like the distribution of these weak and strong cells. And we need to somehow uh, uh, express this information in a um, area efficient way, let's say. Um, or do we need to like give this information for each particular row? 
because we have like hundreds of thousands of rows, right? Uh, across like all banks and uh, ranks. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite a challenge uh, to like have this information exactly for every single row and uh, the memory controller to expect that uh, uh, it needs to, you know, search in a large data structure every time. So uh, based on like uh, how you solve this problem, it's uh, of course has effects on the hardware and software overheads or on consumption, verification, complexity, cost, everything. And uh, how do we determine this profile information? Uh, so is it enough to like test it only once in the post manufacturing before shipping? Or do you need to test in the field uh, sometime, you know, maybe periodically? And uh, yeah, so how are we gonna make sure that, you know, we, we, we profiled uh, in a correct way? So it's just a reminder of like, we have this all layers, <coughs> excuse me, all these layers in the system stack and uh, you need to, so when you ask these questions, you need to basically uh, think of like each of these uh, layers and uh, which one will be responsible, which one will be affected from uh, those decisions. Okay. Yeah, I found my pointer. Yeah. So is microarchitecture ISA runtime system or is it something we need to solve in the algorithm or problem? So you need to find the correct spot basically to solve these problems. And sometimes it's not very clear. Sometimes you need some cooperation across these layers. Uh, okay, so this is basically the architecture layer, right? Uh, like from logic to OS. So we have quite uh, a bunch of collaboration here. So in, in the device level, for example, you get these characteristics, right? And then maybe in the microarchitecture or uh, ISA layer, you need to solve, uh, or in the logic layer, you need to implement some mechanisms. Uh, so yeah, you need some cross-layer uh, implementations often. So, uh, and we talked about testing. So uh, this is just uh, pictures of the testing platforms that they use at the time. And uh, you can see like two papers using these uh, platforms. Those are basically FPGA-based platforms, very similar to DRAM Bander that was presented yesterday. But uh, I can say that these are like ancient versions of those. Today you can uh, perform whatever tests these pa the papers are performing in a much more efficient and uh, more scaled way in, in DRAM Bander. And, uh, yeah, uh, we will talk about these papers a little bit as well, but uh, yeah, I, I highly encourage you to go check these papers to find out like uh, how the data retention time looks like. And this is another picture that we used for this uh, raw hammer paper in 2014, right? And uh, yeah, uh, we already talked about this. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have this, uh, platform that were built uh, before the Ramander and SoftMC, basically the, the uh, uh, like uh, some like uh, uh, early version of that. And it was using some Xilinx ML605 FPGA platform uh, with some temperature control. And uh, they tested uh, a lot of commodity DRAM chips, 248 of them from five manufacturers at that time. And uh, they are representative of seven families based on the equal capacity per device. And these are the families basically that I mentioned there. Okay. So uh, I already showed you this. This is the characterization result that they find out by testing the real DRAM chips. So this is a more uh, scientific way of uh, explaining that data basically. So uh, here on the x-axis, we have the refresh interval in terms of seconds. So from here, it's like uh, every 10 millisecond. And then this is like every second, right? And uh, uh, you see a cutoff at 64 milliseconds. So you don't observe any bit flips. So the y-axis is the uh, cumulative cell failure probability. So probability is zero uh, before 64 milliseconds. And then starting from 64 milliseconds, you already see some errors, like this is the uh, error probability. 
And then this probability increases as you uh, relax the refresh, inter refresh rate or refresh interval here, right? So if you refresh every cell at 128 milliseconds, you, you observe around like 30 cell failing. In 256 milliseconds, you observe like 1,000 cells failing. Uh, yeah. And it increases like this. So this is quite like a, a typical uh, distribution or behavior of this retention time. So the question is like, can we exploit this to reduce refresh operations at low cost? Uh, because like, we don't want to uh, unnecessarily aggressively refresh every cell while we have like only this many cells failing among like millions of cells, right? In a 32 gigabyte DRAM, here we go. Yeah, so we have the capacity here. Okay, so the key idea is radar. It's exactly what you said. Refresh weak rows more frequently or the rows less frequently. This is a very straightforward, very simple idea. And it was not, it was not implemented before 2012. I'm not sure if it's implemented today as well, actually. Uh, we need to figure that out as well. Um, uh, but yeah, this paper was the first to explain the benefits of that and uh, how effective this idea can be. But uh, yeah. I guess we will get into that in a little bit. So uh, this is a simple explanation of how radar uh, goes. So you have a profiling step that identifies the retention time of all DRAM rows. And it can be done at the design time or during operations. So you can periodically do that in the field as well. And it has a second uh, step that we didn't talk about. It's called binning. So basically, you find the rows that are weak uh, or the, that are strong, like at some strength, basically, uh, and you, you classify them into some categories. And uh, basically, you create multiple sets of different uh, uh, strength, data retention strength uh, levels, let's say. And uh, you need to uh, understand if these rows, uh, if, if a given row is a member of a given strength level or a, a given bin, basically. And uh, to understand that, this paper proposes to use balloon filters for efficient and scalable storage because we don't want to store data for each particular DRAM chip. Okay. So uh, uh, it managed to uh, represent uh, this distribution in just like 1.25 kilobyte of storage for a 32 gigabyte DRAM memory. And uh, the third step is naturally refreshing. So memory control refreshes rows in different bins at different rates, right? So, yeah. Okay, so we uh, this is uh, the um, results and the takeaways. So uh, we have a 32 gigabyte DRAM system with eight cores and it runs various workloads here. And the uh, Raider's hardware cost is 1.25 kilobytes. Uh, and this is because it implements like two different balloon filters that we will talk about. And it reduces the refresh uh, operations uh, by, uh, yeah, to this much, basically. And uh, it, it, it also reduces the dynamic DRAM energy because uh, refresh uh, consumes uh, a significant portion of the energy. And uh, it reduces the idle DRAM power reduction as well because when DRAM is idle, it, it performs refresh, right? And uh, the performance improvement is also uh, a key here. So we, we uh, open up some bandwidth basically by skipping some refresh operations. So we can serve some requests faster. So overall, it gives us around like 9% uh, speed up uh, in system performance here. And when we look at the, how the benefits change with the device capacity on the x-axis, so this is energy per axis, so this is the energy plot, right? Um, and the blue one is auto refresh. The, the, this, this is the, sta um, the industry standard that refreshes everywhere at, every row at 64 millisecond. And green one is radar. So uh, in four gigabit DRAM chip, you have like 16% reduction in the energy. But if you go to like 64 gigabit, then um, the projected 
performance gain, uh, sorry, energy gain is like 50%, right? And uh, weighted speed up is a performance metric that we keep using for uh, multi-core workloads. Um, so for uh, so for this metric, higher is better. So in four gigabit, uh, you improve the performance uh, by nine percent. But if you go to like sixty-four gigabit, it increases to like let's say two x, right? So one hundred eight percent. Okay. So this is the full reference of the paper. And uh, if you're interested, of course, there are some uh, similar, uh, sorry, there are other papers in this, on the similar topics. So this uh, paper talks about memory scaling uh, uh, from the architecture perspective. And this one is improving the DRAM performance by parallelizing refresh with access. Actually, we will uh, talk about another paper. So this paper was published in HPC in 2014. It's a very neat idea. Uh, that, uh, sorry, and in DRAM banks, you have different subarrays. So uh, because of some uh, signal integrity challenges uh, uh, and for to sustain like uh, low latency in DRAM accesses, a DRAM bank contains, uh, it, although the DRAM bank contains uh, tens of thousands of rows, you actually implement it in a way that there are like smaller arrays inside this DRAM bank. And, uh, there are some like intermediate uh, local uh, buffers that you can uh, fetch the data to and I'll serve from there in high speed. <laughs> and uh, uh, essentially these smaller arrays can be, uh, uh, can be uh, um, uh, used in, in parallel, even though it is not supported in, even in today's chips. And this paper in 2014 actually uh, proposes to do that to parallelize the uh, refresh and accesses by uh, leveraging this uh, parallelism. Uh, we will not talk about this paper, but uh, last year in 2022, uh, we published another paper showing that we can actually do this in off-the-shelf DRAM chips. So this paper explains how you can enable it by changing the DRAM circuitry uh, with some minor modifications. And the paper that we will talk about shows that it is already supported to some extent in current DRAM chips, uh, even though it is not still supported officially in the documents. So we can still uh, uh, get benefit of this idea. Okay, so uh, I'll just repeat like two takeaways uh, for this lecture basically. So breaking the abstraction layer between the components and transformation, uh, transformation hierarchy levels is important and uh, knowing what is underneath enables you to understand and solve the problems. Another takeaway, um, we need cooperation basically between components and layers so that we can enable more effective solutions and systems. Okay, let's look at Raider in a, uh, in a uh, deeper way. So uh, as I said, like this, this observation is clear and the idea is super simple, just like, use some heterogeneous uh, refresh rate, right? But there's the saying that good ideas are a dime a dozen. So dime is like 10 cents and dozen is like $12, right? So it's, it's like a small portion. And making them work is oftentimes the real contribution. So when you find an idea like, um, so basically in research, it, it often happens that you come up with an idea and that idea was explored by some other people in the past and um, uh, there are some benefits and trade-offs already reported somewhere. Um, and uh, people can complain that that idea is not new and stuff, but uh, basically uh, the real contribution actually uh, comes uh, in making the things work. Because when you try uh, making the idea work, you uh, uh, face a lot of challenges on the way about profiling, about binning, about refreshing, for example, for this radar work. And you need to go into, uh, go dig deep into like each of these aspects of this work. And you need to find like individual challenges. You need to provide individual solutions to them. And all of them should be really effective and efficient. Okay, so uh, how we do profiling in this radar work. Uh, you basically write data to the row and prevent it from being refreshed. Basically you disable refresh and wait for some time. 
and I measure the uh, time before data corruption. So you cannot, the, the thing is, unless you read the data from DRAM role, you don't know if there's a bit flip or not, right? It's like Schrodinger's cat. And uh, once you read the role, you actually refresh it because activating a row already connects the bit line to the DRAM cell. And uh, when the sense amplifier amplifies that signal, it already restores the charge in the DRAM cell. So you cannot run a test for like an hour and uh, every millisecond you probe the cell and see if there is a bit flip. Because every time you probe, you refresh the cell. So this is the challenge for this profilum, for example. So what they do is initially they write this data and then after 64 milliseconds, they read and then they don't see any bit flip. Okay, then they uh, go back. And then this time, instead of 64 milliseconds, they wait 128 milliseconds and then read it again. And then they observe some bit flip. And then it doesn't tell you exactly the, uh, what, what the exactly the retention time for this cell, but we know that it's somewhere in between 64 and 128 milliseconds. So this, is, this doesn't give us really accurate information, but it is accurate enough for us to say that, okay, we can refresh this row every 64 milliseconds and it will work. And uh, for these rows, for example, you don't observe any bit flips. So what you need to do, you need to uh, close them again, wait for 256 milliseconds, and then try reading it. And now you see a bit flip here, right? And then the data retention time is between these two values here. And if you don't see any bit flips still, it's larger than 256 milliseconds. So you can actually continue doing this experiment, right? You can try after 512 milliseconds, after one second, for example. Uh, I guess this work just like stops there because 256 milliseconds is like large enough to have like very low overhead. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> so to, to build some confidence into your observation, uh, you need to repeat this test many times basically. Ah, so the question is, uh, is it enough to test this one time or are, is there some probabilistic process uh, in observing these bit flips? Can we test it like one time, uh, we observe a bit flip, another time we don't observe a bit flip? Is this a question? Yeah, okay. So basically you, you have, um, uh, you, you, you need to repeat this test many times basically. And uh, in, in some cases you see like very um, uh, deterministic uh, behavior. In some cases you might not see. Uh, so you need to account for the worst case as well. So if you see a bit flip in like one of those iterations of the test, maybe you need to say that oh, it's an unsafe zone. And on top of that, actually, there is another effect called uh, variable retention time, VRT, where uh, uh, randomly some cells can switch between two states uh, when they are activated. So uh, it can be like in a low retention time or higher retention time state. We will talk about that in the uh, second part of this lecture, I, I believe. So uh, we will come back to that. And there are some mechanisms for those as well. Are there other questions? Yeah, could you use the microphone? I guess it's easier <laughs> if, if on the on the table. If you keep pushing it, yeah, just like hold it. Ah, like yes, ah, cool. <laughs> so I was wondering if so. How do you this table like fresh? Like better? Yes. And Oh, that's a very good question. So uh, in the way this auto refresh is implemented, the DRAM chip uh, internally doesn't initiate a refresh uh, operation. So how it works is in, in your computer, for example, when you're using the computer when like uh, the device is active, um, the memory controller uh, periodically keeps sending refresh commands every 7.8 microseconds. And uh, when the DRAM chip receives that refresh command, internally it has some counters and it decides like which row to refresh. And it has 
about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, around like 300 nanoseconds of time window to perform refresh on a bunch of rows. And that's like, uh, just like um, handled internally. But if you do not send refresh command, then uh, the DRAM chip does not perform refresh operation. So as an alternative to that, uh, there is a like power, power down mode, one of the power down modes that enables self refresh. So, uh, but it, it is, uh, you need to explicitly send some commands to the DRAM chip to tell the chip that it will not receive any commands for some time. So it's, it's a special mod in, in, in the chip. Uh, in, in that case, like it, it, it initiates the refresh commands by itself, but it's, it's a complete different story. And we don't have to worry about that because we do not put DRAM chip into that mode as well in these tests. So um, we just like keep it using in the normal operation mode and we don't send refresh commands and refresh doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, the proposal is to, uh, actually there are two proposals here. Uh, I will come to that. So you can implement reader both in the memory control, e either in the memory controller or in the DRAM chip. But uh, what we talk about uh, mainly is in the memory controller. Other questions? Okay. So what do you think? Is the profile easy? You have to test some rows. And you already mentioned that uh, you need to iterate the tests, right? Maybe one time measuring is not uh, enough. So the quick answer is no, right? So uh, yeah, we already talked about this variable retention time. Uh, but there's also another thing that I forgot to mention, data pattern dependence. Actually, this is the time to mention it. So depending on what data you write in the DRM cell and in the cells around it, uh, you can uh, change the retention time. It's not like you can change it to whatever, but depending on what uh, data is written there, it, the cell exhibits a different data retention behavior. And the variable retention time, we will come back to that uh, sometime soon. Um, it basically causes the DRAM chip to switch between uh, high and low leakage states and uh, exhibits low or high data retention time. So, okay. I already said this. Uh, so when a row is activated, all bit lines are perturbed simultaneously, right? So uh, you have your word lines, bit lines here, and bit lines are connected to the sense amplifier. And you activate this whole row uh, by asserting this word line, and you uh, share the cell charge for each, uh, for like a bit line that corresponds to that cell here. And, uh, uh, if you have some electrical noise uh, on the bit line, it affects the reliable sensing. So there's that as well. And the magnitude of the noise is affected by the values in nearby cells. So this is called bit line, bit, bit line to bit line coupling. So uh, you have like, uh, uh, depend on what data you have on this bit line and this bit line can affect the data retention time of this cell, right? Okay, it's animated already. And there's also some bit line to word line coupling. Uh, basically, it's an electric coupling between uh, each bit line and the activated word line. So uh, these two structures can uh, create some noise on each other. And typically, actually, on the word lines, you put a higher voltage, maybe the double of the voltage, uh, compared to what you drive bit lines and DRAM cells with. Uh, so it, it has a huge impact. And actually the uh, noise uh, created by the word lines is playing a high, uh, uh, like important role in raw hammer as well. Uh, we didn't dive into that level uh, in the previous lectures, but maybe in the future we will talk about the effect of voltage. I'm not sure about that. So um, uh, yeah. So the retention time of the cell depends on the pattern stored in nearby cells. And we need to find the worst case data pattern for the retention time to ensure that uh, the cell will not uh, observe any data retention, experience any data retention with Phillips. And uh, this data pattern dependency uh, has implications on our profiling. So, uh, 
So we need to try different data patterns, basically. Um, so intuitive approach is identifying data pattern that induces the worst case retention time for a particular cell or device. But the problem is we do not know, right? It's, it's very hard to know uh, uh, from the memory controller, like uh, which bits will interfere with each other because those can be organized in different ways inside the DRAM chip as well. So you need to understand like how the DRAM ge geometry is. And uh, yeah, there's an opaque mapping. So if you remember like, from yesterday in the block hammer lecture, I talked about uh, some row remapping, for example, um, that happens internally inside the DRAM chip and you do not have that information from the memory controller. Um, a similar case is here as well. You also have like some shuffling, some remapping uh, across different columns as well. So it's, uh, you, you, you do not know any of these and that's a challenge. Um, yeah, so I already talked about this. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, so the worst case coupling noise can be uh, uh, caused by some non-obvious uh, things, right? Here, like it line coupling effects uh, in the second order. Yeah. Okay, this is the other challenge. Uh, the retention time of a DRAM cell changes randomly over time. A cell alternates between multiple retention time states. So the leakage uh, of a cell uh, changes sporadically due to a, a charge trap in the gate oxide. So what happens is that um, do we have any, wait, this is blocking my view, okay. So basically the theory is that uh, you activate this role and then you have some electron trapped in the gate oxide in this transistor. So this transistor does not turn off completely. And as a result, you keep losing charge from here, right? or from other leakage paths as well. So the trap can happen in anywhere uh, in theory. So when the trap becomes occupied, charge leaks more re readily uh, from transistor strain, right? And then uh, as a result, you have short retention time. So this is called trap-assisted gate-induced drain leakage. And this process appears to be a random process. Uh, it's uh, explored in this paper. You can go check it. Um, uh, basically, uh, the impact or implication of this to our profile is that worst case retention time depends on a random process now. So you need to test it many times and you need to find the worst case. So this is like an example cell from a 3 gigabit chip family. So you have the retention time on the uh, Y axis and uh, uh, the experiment time in X axis. So we keep trying, we keep testing the retention time for this chip. And you see like sometimes it uh, uh, shows the retention time around like uh, two to three seconds in these like local minimums. And so some other times it's like more than six seconds here. So it keeps jumping back and forth, right? And this is completely random. So basically in our retention profile, we need to find these minimums, not this like common case here because we do not want to have end up having this state and having a bit flip. Okay, and when you look at how the distribution looks like in a, uh, in a chip, like we have the population of DRAM cells here, the fraction of DRAM cells are like, um, uh, uh, the, the population is uh, shown by the darker color here. And uh, the maximum retention time and minimum retention time are on X and Y axis, axis. So you can see that. Uh, so any, any uh, basically, so, okay, there's a highlight actually here. So if you look at this line, basically in this line, minimum retention time and maximum retention time are the same, right? So the, uh, if there's no VRT, what you expect is the truth. But, in this triangle, we have many cells actually that show different minimum and maximum retention times. Yeah, so most failing cells exhibit VRT and uh, this is a real problem in profiling. 
Okay. So the problem one is uh, uh, this this process seems random. So we do not uh, have a good understanding of, well, we have some theories how it happens, but we do not have a good way of detecting it in the re uh, runtime, let's say, that uh, a cell will be uh, 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 switching to a shorter data retention state. And this VRT is memorialist random process uh, based on the findings in this paper. So it, uh, the history actually doesn't affect that random process at a given time. And it completes the retention time profiling. And uh, yeah, so you can, uh, you can try like exposing the chip to very high temperatures uh, and uh, uh, you can, uh, yeah, you can trigger like more cells to uh, suffer from VRT basically. Uh, there's that effect. So you need to test for like high temperatures as well. And it can happen during soldering of DRAM chips, manufacturer's retention time profile. And uh, yeah, uh, there's no real like uh, absolute solution for that. So one option for uh, future work, uh, I guess this is how it's defined in Raider paper. It's to use ECC to continuously profile DRAM online uh, while aggressively re reducing the refresh rate. And no need to keep ECC overhead in check, uh, okay. So this is, this is a paper that actually uh, profiles the uh, uh, retention uh, on real DRAM chips a lot. Uh, not a lot, like it's, it's rigorously. And this is one of those papers that are uh, chosen for this retrospective issue. So uh, I, I highly recommend you to go check like that two page paper first and then uh, look at the full paper as well. And it's likely that we will have uh, this paper in um, uh, homework. Uh, reviews, yes. Ah, oh, okay. Repeat, I guess, profiling. Uh, okay. That's a very good question. So it's aging. Uh, so the question is, do we need to repeat the uh, tests as DRAM ages, right? Um, aging has a huge effect on, uh, let's say, flash memories. That's already well known. But for DRAM, there's not uh, enough rigorous studies, actually, uh, to, to show the effect of aging. Um, I think it's an open research problem, and it's always a concern, actually, when we do some profiling and propose some mechanisms based on that. There's always that weakness that uh, we cannot guarantee that this profile will be true 10 years from now. Uh, so uh, I guess the answer is like, it's a open research problem and there are works going on uh, and yeah, it's important. Okay, so how can we reliably find the retention time of all DRAM cells? Yes, sorry. Yes, please. About the memory controller, uh, that the memory controller in the commands. Yes. The memory controller asks, uh, <coughs> yeah, so based on the specification, how it works is um, so. Uh, the memory controller sends a refresh command, and that refresh command doesn't have any um, uh, address parameter with that. So the DRAM chip internally uh, identifies which rows to refresh. So the memory controller doesn't care about that in, in the auto refresh mode that that is like commonly used in today's systems. Alternatively, when you activate a row, you end up refreshing the row. So activation is a way of like, refreshing the row. So if, you're, if you don't want to use auto refresh for some reason, uh, uh, and we have a paper actually that does that, you can send individual activation commands to individual rows, and you can specify like uh, each row when to, when to refresh and yeah. 
because I was thinking of memory. We are designed, so whenever you have more access to each of those things, so I have a status of reader. Uh, I, I couldn't quite get it. So, what is the question? Uh, oh, sorry, by the way, just the mic. I guess people cannot hear apparently from your ah, okay. site. Uh, so, I was thinking of uh, we to have more access to the uh, to which pattern the DRAM. Uh, so, can change uh, the profiling of the DRAM. Oh, based on what data pattern is written in the DRAM row. Uh, I think that's a good point. There are definitely data patterns that we know that uh, they are more resilient to uh, leakage and they don't uh, experience uh, data retention with Philips as often. But then there, there is a huge challenge over there. Right? So now you need to keep for every row, like what kind of data pattern is stored inside. So how can you summarize that information? Maybe to summarize that information, you need to have another DRAM ship to, you know, put all the data pattern there. So because it's like each bit is, can be a different uh, voltage level. But uh, yeah, if you can summarize that somehow, I guess you can use it, yeah. Or maybe you can force the DRAM, for example, let's say your DRAM uh, row has a uh, higher retention time for zeros than ones. Uh, while you're writing data inside, you can compare how many ones, how many zeros you have. And based on that, you can invert the data as well, for example. So there can be some like uh, smart ways of doing that. What I said is not super smart, but I guess you can find a smarter one. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, so uh, how can we reliably find the retention time of all DRAM cells? So we want to do that, and uh, uh, so that we can make the DRAM reliable and secure, and make techniques like radar work and improve performance and energy. And this is the focus of this paper. I really uh, recommend you to go check it again. Uh, Okay, so uh, there is, uh, yeah, next we will talk about avatar. That is a mechanism that uh, aims to deal with uh, the variable retention time uh, concept. Uh, it's also a really important paper and I, I highly recommend you to read the full paper. I will present it next, but uh, I think we are a good place to take a break. So what time is it now? Oh, it has been al already an hour. So can we make it like a seven minute break? Does it sound good? And we will be back at like 2.20. Okay, thank you very much.
So you are so you turn from the picture you are transporting all and then this uh south local again uh you can the vertical it just seems like shifting vertically so you can you need to move it and sing it by the So you have element A here and then another element B here. So you can activate this, activate this, and then do the export by I save it somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, it's it is. 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 To the copy stone either. So we, uh, I think so, but the time first. Yeah, also, that's actually the I thought I thought it should it should be like this that the cog is gone over is back. If it's not uh, I don't like <laughs> yeah. yeah, well um <laughs> to see if you yeah. uh, what the yeah. or that or you Yeah, I think it's, I think it has, 
you have like three arrays. One is the position of the home part. It's not it's not like this. It's home time, home time. And each entry is four bytes. Okay. Okay, that's the case. The direct net channels. So, one, we have sets, but it set only one at line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Will never be used anyway because it's uh, okay. For loop, Let the let's start. Uh, it's already like 22 past, so <laughs> sorry, it was a short break. We have a lot to cover today, uh, but we, we are like one third away already. So, uh, okay, let's talk about this paper, Avatar. This was published in DSM. Uh, it's an important security uh, and reliable to dependable systems conference in 2015. It's also not that old, actually. Okay. Oops. Something happened. Okay. Okay. So the insight of Avatar is that uh, retention failures happen randomly and uh, to avoid them, we can upgrade the row on ECCR. So it's basically the idea is to have some feedback from the circuit itself so that it's a start sorting. Okay, so you, you get some uh, feedback from the DRAM cells themselves and uh, you change the retention time based on that. And uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so let's say uh, you you refresh rows in a, a larger refresh window, and you observe a bit flip here. Uh, this ECC already corrects it, right? And then it updates the retention profile over there, and you check your retention profile to uh, redefine the uh, refresh period for this particular row. And uh, therefore, the row is protected from future retention failures. So Avatar mitigates this variable retention time by increasing the refresh rate on error. And it, it does scrubbing uh, periodically so that uh, before you need to access that row, actually, uh, you can see if there's any bit flip. And, um, yeah. are, are you guys familiar with scrubbing? Uh, does it mean anything to you? So basically what you do is like in a system, uh, it's not particularly for DRAM in other uh, source of storage memories as well. You can uh, hear this term. The idea is to periodically just like visit those, uh, those cells uh, to see if there's any error happened and then use whatever error correction capability you have to correct those errors and store them back so that you avoid errors accumulating and uh, going to a state that it's not uh, correctable anymore. So basically, uh, yeah, it's a periodic operation like this. It keeps visiting all the rows. And whenever it sees uh, a correctable error, it corrects it and updates the retention profile. And you need to do it uh, periodically enough so that you don't have like many bit flips that you cannot correct, maybe that maybe that cause like a silent corruption, you need to avoid that. Uh, basically you need to fine tune a lot of things over there. 
So here we have the number of months since testing and the reduction in refresh, uh, uh, refresh uh, percentage here. So uh, without VRT, uh, you need to, so you end up keeping this constant, right? And with avatar, uh, you basically uh, need to reduce this, uh, basically. Um, well, not need to. It enables you to reduce this refresh. So it, it reduces refresh by like 60 to 70 percent, similar to multi-rate refresh, but with VRT tolerance. Um, I hope it's clear. Like, if you if you don't do this like profiling and updating, you you need to keep refreshing them more frequently all the time, right? But you can relax if uh, you don't have uh, errors. So. Uh, uh, the paper concludes that retention testing once a year increased refresh reduction from 60 to 70%. And this is the uh, speed up gains. Uh, on the y axis, we see the speed up. On the x axis, we see different DRAM chip densities. Um, so, uh, red one is no refresh. And uh, this is like the headroom for improvement, right? So, if we don't have any refresh, we get like uh, here it's uh, some modest gain, but if you go to highly dense DRAM chips, we see around more than 50% of speed up, right? For no refresh. But we cannot completely eliminate refresh. So with Avatar, you can actually uh, achieve a, a high uh, fraction of this headroom for improvement. So it obtains like two thirds of the performance of no refresh and higher benefits uh, in higher density here. Okay, and this is the energy delay product. This is another metric that is commonly used. So you basically multiply the energy consumption with the uh, latency or execution time, whatever delay you define here. So it has the notion of energy consumption and performance together. And uh, they check how energy delay product changes. With no refresh, you reduce energy delay product a lot. So uh, both energy and delay are uh, the things that we don't want them to be high, right? So lower is better in this plot. And uh, with no refresh, you can reduce this energy delay product to like 40% compared to baseline, right? And Avatar achieves already like 50% here for 64 gigabits. Uh, the same story, uh, the benefits increase with the increased uh, uh, density. And this is the full paper, full references to the paper. Uh, uh, I highly recommend you to go read that paper as well. Um, so this is another paper that we will mention, but not uh, go in detail. So this is uh, Parbor from Samir Ahan. Uh, it's uh, investigating the, the data pattern dependency in, uh, uh, in DRAM failures, basically. Um, it's, it basically provides an efficient system level technique for that. And uh, another paper, uh, Again, from Samir Han, uh, a follow-up uh, on data, data pattern dependency of these errors. And another paper here uh, uh, that handles both data pattern dependency and VRT in a way that, uh, so this, this paper is called Reach Profiler uh, and there's an abbreviation Reaper. So this Reaper uh, basically uh, provides an efficient way of testing DRAM chip while you're using the DRAM chip, so online. And uh, it's important because it's uh, because of several reasons. So this paper provides the first experimental analysis on mobile DRAM chips. <clears throat> Excuse me, the LPDDR4 ones, and uh, it analyzes the complex trade-off space of retention time profiling. And uh, it enables fast and robust profiling at higher refresh intervals and temperatures. Uh, so the basic observation again is only a few cells require uh, frequent refreshing. So we have the RAM module here and internally we have weakened uh, strong cells here. And uh, let's say the cell is leaking fast and this cell is leaking slow. Uh, you, you don't want to refresh them at the same uh, refresh rate, but it's hard to identify uh, which one is which and when it is that. 
because there is a lot of variation caused by the process. Uh, uh, the process means manufacturing process there. Uh, the voltage, temperature, variable retention time, data pattern dependency, and you can make this list longer, actually. Uh, there are a lot of effects. And our goal is to quickly and efficiently identify the error-prone cells. And uh, how, this, how does this paper do that? Uh, it starts with experimental uh, characterization uh, to uh, basically understand the real chip behavior, right? And um, it tests... 368 real LPDDR4 chips. And it concludes that cells are more likely to fail at an increased refresh interval or temperature. So basically, uh, yeah, we will come to that. And uh, the second uh, conclusion of this paper is that uh, the profile involves a complex trade of space in terms of speed, coverage, and false positives. So yeah, this plot actually explains everything. So on the x-axis, you have the refresh interval. As you go to the right, you refresh less frequently, right? You have a larger time window uh, in between two consecutive refreshes. And on the y-axis, you have temperature. It's, I guess, obvious that as you go high, temperature increases. So we want to operate here uh, because uh, it's a reliable point, right? But uh, at the point where we operate, we cannot actually, uh, it's, so we do not observe in a uh, many bit flips. And uh, uh, to understand the chip behavior, it makes more sense to profile it when the refresh interval is larger, you refresh less frequently, and the temperature is higher. Uh, so when you do that, uh, you can complete your profile faster, and it's more reliable, and you have less false positives. And po false positive here means that you you identify, a DRAM, you, you, you refresh a DRAM row uh, more frequently than you need to. So you, don't, you do not want to do that because uh, you want to get uh, as much performance uh, as possible out of that. So uh, based on this key idea, basically, uh, they implement a, a profiling uh, routine and uh, they show that the profiling is 2.5x faster than the state-of-the-art baseline, and it provides 99% of, of coverage and a 50% false positive rate. And it can be faster, it can go to 3.5x uh, if you have more false positives. Okay, uh, by the way, this 50% false positive rate is not like based on the uh, set of DRAM cells you have. It's like, compared to the state of the art. So don't, don't get this like more than 100% is like everything is false positive, right? It's like false positive rate compared to the state of the art is increasing more than two x. Okay, so it enables operating at longer refresh intervals by reducing the overall profile overhead. And uh, as a result, you can gain around 16.3% end to end performance and you can reduce the DRAM power consumption by 36.4%. So this is a full paper, uh, again. Uh, it, it was just like a short summary. Uh, but yeah, uh, I again encourage you to go check the paper. You don't have to know all the details about that. Um, so um, that paper was from Minesh Patel. Uh, Minesh actually visited us uh, a few weeks ago, uh, he's a, a alumnus from uh, Safari, alumnus of Safari. He uh, uh, got his PhD last year, and uh, he will soon start as an assistant professor in uh, Rutgers University in the US. Um, and he gave a talk uh, about uh, uh, pretty much uh, all of his observations uh, out of these papers. So this is uh, one of the older papers from him. And then uh, after uh, this data the retention characterization, he also worked on understanding the ONDI uh, error correction mechanisms that are implemented inside DRAM chips because uh, uh, they, are, they obfuscate the circuit level behavior basically when you try characterizing it. And he found a, a nice way of identifying what kind of ONDI error correction mechanism is implemented inside a given DRAM chip. 
and um, how to, you know, uh, when you do the retention test, when you see the bit flips, how you convert it back to the, um, uh, uh, the, the distribution of the raw bit error rates before their correction, so that you can understand the real chip characteristics, right? So he published a, a few papers about that. The first one is this, Understand a Model on the Error Correction in Modern DRAM. So this was published in DSN in 2019. And uh, this got a best paper award. And uh, another one is be the exact ECC recovery beer. Uh, so this is a more systematical and uh, efficient way of doing uh, this uh, on the ECC identification. Uh, and it was published in last, uh, not last year, 2020 micro. And it also got a best paper award over there. And uh, uh, I guess the latest paper on this topic from him is HARP. This is a more practical and effective way of identifying uncorrectable errors in memory chips and uh, 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 in presence of uh, on the error correcting codes. So uh, all these papers are like quite interesting and uh, we hope to have some uh, guest lecture from Minesh as well uh, for uh, uh, talking about the future uh, on this as well. So uh, I will just like give some high level overview of uh, what these works do uh, essentially. So uh, you have your profiler here, uh, probably implementing your processor or your FPGA in your memory controller somewhere, but outside of the DRAM chip, right? Because you, you purchase the DRAM chip, you cannot change inside. And uh, DRAM chips, the modern ones, already implement some on the ECC. Uh, and you want to identify this on the ECC because uh, from the profiler, you need to understand. So the, the goal of the profiler is to understand actually which bits are at risk for error, right? And uh, on the ECC change how error appears in errors appear in the, to the profiler because you, you have some bit flips in the storage and then some of them are corrected. Some of them are not corrected. Maybe in some cases you correct it wrong because there are too many bit flips. And uh, as a result, you get a different distribution of bit flips and you cannot make any um, uh, healthy conclusion out of that. So the goal of this work uh, is to understand and address any challenges that ONDA ECC introduces in error profiling. And <clears throat> there are some challenges of doing that. So, uh, uh, so as the uh, bit flips increase, the, the cost of this thing exponentially increases, right? The total number of uh, at risk, yeah. So um, when you have on the ECC, the number of uh, bits uh, at risk increases because you, you get obfuscation from the uh, error correction. And it makes it harder to identify individual at risk bits interferes with uh, commonly used data patterns for memory testing. And uh, uh, the key observation is uh, that there are like two sources of errors. Uh, the one, uh, one of them is the direct error. So you have an error in this DRAM cell. And for some reason, your ECC does not catch this. And you observe this error here, right? And in some cases, this ECC, while trying to correct the error, it injects another error here. If uh, the number of errors is uh, beyond the ECC's uh, correction capability. And uh, this is basically an artifact of the ONDA ECC algorithm. And uh, yeah, and there, there's an upper bound by this algorithm as well. Uh, so uh, yeah. Uh, and the key idea here is to decouple the profiling for direct and indirect errors. And how you do that? Uh, you keep doing the active profiling. Uh, you quickly identify all direct errors with existing profiling techniques using an on the ECC bypass path. And you also do something called reactive profiling that safely identifies indirect errors using secondary ECC, at least as strong as on the ECC. So uh, HARP, the latest work that I showed, reduces the problem of profiling with ONDA ECC to profiling without ONDA ECC. 
so you can reliably uh, bypass in a very efficient way uh, the on the ECC to uh, update your uh, error profile. Uh, okay, so HARP improves coverage and performance relative to the two state-of-the-art uh, baseline profile algorithms by some important, uh, yeah, 20% 20, 20 to 62% faster and 99th percentile coverage, right? It's, it's quite good. And uh, it outperforms the best performing baseline in a case study uh, by 3.7x. Uh, okay. So the conclusion is that HARP overcomes all three profiling challenges. And uh, yeah, this is the full paper. Again, we will not go into details of uh, how HARP does that. Uh, you can check the full paper. Um, okay, so uh, I guess we will go back to Razor now and uh, talk about the binning because we talked about profiling. Uh, so, uh, so this lecture is organized in a way that, you know, we, uh, I'm trying to walk you through the challenges of a given research problem. In this case, like Raider is just like as, a, as an example. And the first challenge was the profiling, and we already talked about profiling. Now it's the binning time. So uh, we already have our profile. Let's assume that it's uh, it's uh, giving us the correct picture of what's going on inside the RAM chip. And how can we efficiently and scale the store these rows into retention time bins? So the idea is to use uh, hardware bloom filters as uh, proposed by Bloom in 1970. So it's quite an old technique actually, but you can see that these old techniques can be quite useful in uh, recent uh, solutions as well. It's impressive. Um, so uh, I'm gonna ask again today, uh, are you guys familiar with Bloom filters? There's no answer, but I assume you are. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. Okay, let's go through uh, the explanation. So this is basically a probabilistic data structure that compactly represents uh, a set membership information. So basically what you try to understand is, okay, so based on the screen, uh, some of you have the, the microphone pressed. So do you have any like, uh, I don't know, phone or something that is uh, put on top of the microphone? It's like a bunch of microphones seems like it's enabled. Do we have any problem in the audio on Zoom or YouTube? Okay. Do you know a way of disabling desk like microphones? I can check with the headphones. Okay. Okay, I'll just continue. Okay, we try to understand if an, a given element is a member of a given set or not. And this is an approximate set membership. So you basically use one bit per element to indicate absence or presence of each element from an element space of n elements. It's, it's like a tongue twister. And the approximate set membership is defined as, uh, uh, so you use a, a much smaller number of bits and indicate each element's presence or absence with a subset of those bits. And uh, uh, some of these elements map to the bits other elements also map to. So this is the Eliasin thing in the, uh, as they call in the literature. Uh, so it, it can cause some false positives, but we will come to that. So you have basically three main operations with Bloom filters. You can insert an element into a set. You can test if an element belongs to a set and you can remove all elements. You cannot remove a single element. So uh, here, uh, what we have is a, a bit array. Uh, so uh, when we want to insert an element, let's say in this case, row one, you provide the uh, identifier of this uh, element, in, in this case, row ID, let's say, or one here, right? You provide that number to multiple hash functions. It doesn't have to be three 
uh, it can be like some number of hash functions. And each of these hash functions computes an index. And uh, by using that index, you go to the element in that bit, uh, not element, okay, the bit in that bit stream, and then set it if you're inserting the element. So initially, all of them are zero, and you make this one as you insert row one. And then uh, uh, when you ask if row one, row one is in the, uh, in the set, you basically run the identifier of this element again through these hash functions. You go check if all these elements are set. So if all of them are set, then uh, yes, row one is uh, in the set. If any of them is uh, zero, let's say this, these two are one and this is zero, then when you end all these, you will get a result of zero, right? So it means that this element is not a member of the set. So yeah, this is the uh, example. So row two, so we run the same thing for row two. It happens that the hash function one goes here and function two goes to a, a location where we have one because of inserting row one. And then another one here maps. And uh, when you, sorry, when you end all these results, zero and one and zero, you get zero, right? And then it means that row two does not present in this uh, set. Okay, uh, when we also insert row four on top of that, it will map to some other bit locations and you will set those as well. And then let's say we test if row five present here. So we didn't insert row five at all, but when we run these hash functions, it happens that this uh, indices are calculated and all of them correspond to some bit locations where we have uh, one as the bit. So as a result, you get one. And uh, so this balloon filter tells you that row five is a member of the set, but we didn't insert row five before. So this is a false positive. So th there is a wrong information here. Uh, and you need to be aware that balloon filter can do this uh, in your application. And this is the original paper that uh, uh, proposes balloon filter is from Burden Bloom. And it's published in 1970. So it's, it's really fascinating for me to see like an idea presented in 1970 is still have an impact on uh, real problems of today. Okay. So we have some advantages and disadvantages by balloon filter. So it enables storage efficient representation. So you don't have to store a, as large a bit array as the number of elements in your uh, set. You can uh, store it really efficiently. Uh, and insertion and testing of set membership are fast. You don't need to do some expensive search. You just like run some hash functions. They map to some locations. It's almost all one, right? Maybe it's all one. Yeah. Yeah, if hash number of hash functions is the same, it's all one. Okay, so it's fast. And uh, there's no false negatives. So this is really important. If you, if you, uh, if you did not insert an element into a set, you can end up having the result that, yeah, maybe this element is in the set. So we, we already uh, saw the false positive. But the other uh, scenario is not possible. If an element is a member of a set, there is no way that balloon filter tells you the opposite. And it enables some trade-offs between time, storage efficiency, and false positive rate. Uh, and also the disadvantage is the false positive, right? So uh, if your balloon filter is not large enough, there can be a lot of aliasing and you can misidentify uh, a lot of elements as the member of a set. Okay, it's not the right, right data structure when you cannot tolerate false positives. So can we tolerate false positive for Raider? What do you think? I guess it depends, de depends how we define false positives, right? Um, okay. So uh, in, in the Raider's concept, uh, we're putting DRAM rows into sets. 
and uh, a row may be declared present in the balloon filter even if it was not uh, inserted into that into that set. It is not really a problem because uh, you just end up refreshing some rows more frequently than necessary. But this is a small set of rows, hopefully. And no false negative means that rows are never refreshed less frequently than needed. So you get rid of the data retention bit flips, assuming that your profile is correct, of course. <clears throat> okay, uh, so it's scalable because a balloon filter never overflows, unlike a fixed size table. And it's efficient, uh, no need to store info on a per row basis. It's a simpler hardware. It only takes like 1.25 kilobytes for two filters for a 32 gigabyte DRAM system in the case of Raider's profile. Okay, so uh, uh, balloon, using balloon filters is uh, useful uh, in hardware um, where you can tolerate false positive in a set membership test. And you can define the membership of a set accordingly as well, right? If you want, so basically you just need to have some imbalance in your uh, uh, false results. Um, okay, so uh, there are some other examples that use balloon filters. So this radar is the paper that we keep talking about. Uh, yeah, this is another paper from 2012. Uh, the evicted address filter in file mechanism to address both cache pollution and thrashing that uh, does some optimization or like improvement in the uh, in the cache pollution and thrashing mechanism, uh, like uh, the, the, the challenges here. And this is the paper that we talked about uh, yesterday, Glockhammer, that, that, that uses balloon filters to identify if a row is hot or not. So in the false positive case over there, for example, you can uh, misidentify a row as hot while the row is cold, but it's not a problem because uh, you do not observe a bit fill up in a cold row. Uh, the only caveat is that you end up throttling more rows than necessary. So what we need to do for the uh, radar, uh, going back to radar, so uh, we need to choose a refresh candidate row, determine which pin the row is in, and determine if refreshing is needed, okay? So this is how the mechanism works. So the memory controller chooses each row as a refresh candidate. So uh, I guess going back to your question, in Raider's case, uh, we need to uh, handle rows one by one from memory controller if we implement Raider in memory controller, instead of just sending refresh commands. So uh, memory controller chooses what row to refresh, and then it tests. Uh, if the row is uh, a member of uh, the, uh, the set of 64 to 128 millisecond pin. So if the row exists in this set, then it refreshes the row, right? And if it does not exist in the set, then it tests another set. And remember that these test operations are quite cheap. Uh, it's like very low uh, latency. And uh, it tests 128 to 256 millisecond pin. And if it, is a, uh, if it is a member of that set, so the row is refreshed uh, every other 64 milliseconds, so every 128 millisecond. And if it is not a member of this set, then we refresh the row every 256 millisecond. So this is a quite uh, uh, short and uh, um, uh, efficient effective uh, way of uh, identifying these rows without storing per row information. So Raider's baseline design is, uh, it's, it's in the memory controller. It's a refresh control. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, first auto refresh, okay. So in auto refresh, we have the refresh control uh, in DRAM to check like which row to refresh. And uh, the memory controller sends a refresh command, as I said earlier. And Raider can be implemented in either in the memory controller or in the DRAM. So if we implement Raider in the memory controller, we need 256 bytes for this first filter and one kilobyte for the next filter. 
So our head of radar in DRAM controller is just like this much. And it requires three counters, additional commands issued per per refresh. Uh, and uh, and we, we con they consider all these uh, overheads in the evaluations. Uh, if we implement radar inside the DRAM, inside the control logic, so here, uh, the operation is like memory controller still sends refresh commands uh, periodically, or the DRAM uh, handles refresh in a self-refresh mode internally. And whenever a refresh will happen uh, for a row, it uh, tests in internally these uh, filters here. But in this case, uh, when you go like uh, the profile of a chip, uh, you get like very, yeah, much smaller actually filters for each chip, four bytes and 16 bytes. And per chip overhead is significantly smaller. And the total overhead is like, again, similar. Okay. So Raider's hardware cost, we already talked about this, the refresh reduction. We, I already went through this slide earlier. And the benefits increase as DRAM scales in density you see like 50% reduction in energy here and 108% improvement in the weighted speed up, which is the performance metric. Okay. So yeah, what else can you do to reduce the impact of refresh? I guess we are talking about the negative impact of refresh, right? Not positive. So any ideas? These are just some open questions. I don't have answers for these questions. So these are for your like, just like food for thought. Uh, another question, what else can you do if you know the, ref, uh, the retention time of the rows? How can you to measure the retention time of DRAM rows? Can we make the profiling step more efficient, more accurate? So I guess uh, if, you want, if you find these research questions interesting, uh, this paper is really a good paper to read. And I already provided all the references for this paper. This is one of those papers that are chosen for the uh, retrospective issue. And here it comes the retrospective issue again. Okay, so I already went through all these papers. And these are the screenshots. Again, they are just like two page long. So, and including references. So it's like one and a half page. So you can just like take a look at that. Uh, I hope it will give you some idea. They, they will give you some ideas. And let's summarize the DRAM refresh. DRAM refresh is a critical challenge because of the leaky DRAM cells. Um, and uh, when we try scaling the DRAM capacity, uh, we need to refresh more rows. And it causes a lot of time, a lot of energy. So uh, it's not something cheap. And uh, we have several promising solution directions. Uh, we have ways of eliminating unnecessary refreshes. We have ways of reducing the refresh rate with online profiling and detect, uh, detect or correct any errors as, uh, as discussed in Avatar paper, uh, Parbor and uh, uh, Minesh's paper. Uh, Harp also uh, uh, helps in that, right? Uh, but Reaper is cited here. Uh, I already went through that. And uh, another idea that we did not discuss in detail is to parallelize the refreshes with accesses that we will uh, talk about in a little bit. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we have some work that examine the properties of retention time behavior already. And uh, they uh, also enable uh, realistic VRT-aware refresh techniques as shown in this paper, Avatar. And uh, there's, there are many avenues of overcoming DRAM refresh challenges. Uh, handling data pattern dependency and variable retention time phenomena is quite, quite important. And enabling online retention time profile and error mitigation is also still an open challenge. And uh, yeah, uh, we need to... Uh, we can also exploit application behavior uh, in different ways that we will not talk about. And uh, yeah, this is the other work that, uh, that I briefly mentioned that was published in HPC 2014 that, that proposes a way to parallelize refresh with accesses that 
uh, we later on observed that in micro 2022 that we can do this in off the shelf DRAM chips. Uh, okay, so I will talk about this paper next, but we can take another short break. So it's three now, and uh, we can take a 10 minute break. Uh, does it sound good to you, or do you want more? Okay, let's come back at 310.
Okay, I think we can start. Uh, sorry, the three time. Uh, okay, so next we will talk about another way of reducing the refresh uh, overhead uh, in off-the-shelf DRAM chips. Uh, I will also refer back to the other paper when it comes. Uh, so this is a work that we published last year in microconference. Uh, it's like one of my papers. Uh, we did it uh, in collaboration with Top University of Economics and Technology in Turkey and Galicia Supercomputer Center in uh, Spain. Okay, so this is a paper, hidden row activation for reducing the overhead of refresh. So there are two main types of DRAM refresh. The first one is the periodic refresh operations that we keep talking about uh, today. Uh, that periodic restores the charge, DRAM cell leaks, DRAM cells leak over time. And uh, the other one is the one that we use for uh, as row hammer mitigation. So when we repeatedly access DRAM rows, we can observe bit flips in the physically nearby rows. And to avoid that, we preventively refresh um, the victim rows that we call preventive refresh. 
and periodic refresh uh, with increase in DRAM chip density uh, causes uh, more overheads. And it's because uh, now we have a larger capacity in the DRAM chip and more rows needs to be refreshed. And the cells also get smaller, so they store uh, less charge. And with leakage, uh, uh, they can lose their charge easier. And um, this is just a projection of uh, how bad the, um, the system performance goes with the periodic refresh uh, uh, as the RAM chip capacity increases. So this 1.0 is the point that we do not have in a hypoth in an idealistic world, we do not have any refresh. And uh, this curve shows how the performance goes low, right? Uh, as you need to refresh more rows. So more periodic refresh operations incur larger performance overhead as the RAM chip density increases. And um, uh, from another aspect, uh, we also have row hammer. Now we have raw press as well, but at that time we didn't have raw press. So uh, this paper focused on raw hammer only. Uh, so raw hammer vulnerable to worsens as the RAM chip density increases. I already showed you this plot yesterday. Uh, the raw hammer threshold got reduced more than uh, an order of magnitude in less than a decade. And if we project the uh, uh, performance overhead of the uh, most scalable raw hammer uh, defense mechanisms, we can uh, see that when raw hammer threshold goes to less than 100, around like 64 activations, we can see about like 96% slowdown in the system. So you spend most of your time basically doing the uh, preventive refresh operations, which is basically a sort of maintenance operation. <clears throat> so your availability is really bad uh, as this uh, vulnerability it gets worse. Okay, so we have, uh, so our goal in this paper is to reduce the performance overhead of DRAM refresh. Uh, and we, by DRAM refresh, we refer to both periodic and preventive refreshes. And our idea is to hide the refresh latency by refreshing a DRAM row concurrently with activating another row in a different subarray of the same bank. And I know that this key idea does not really mean many things to you, but uh, it will be clear some, in, a, in, a, in a little while. So, okay, so in this paper, we leverage a key insight where uh, when we activate two rows in quick succession, uh, let's say row A and row B, we first send an activation to row A, and then in a very short amount of time, we send another activation to row B, and this means that we are violating a lot of time in constraints here. Um, if these two rows are located in different subarrays that are electrically isolated from each other, then uh, we can refresh uh, one row while accessing another row. So uh, how this happens is as following. So now in this scenario, we want to refresh row A concurrently with activating row B. So this is a time window. Uh, and without our uh, proposal here, uh, this operation would work in the following way. So we would send an activation to row A and wait for row A to refresh, meaning that row A is activated, all the cells are sensed, and the, uh, uh, the voltage uh, uh, difference is amplified, and the cell uh, charge is restored. So all this process is, has already happened here. And then we send a pre-charge that closes the row and pre-charges the bit lines on the bank, and this takes some time as well. And then after that, we need to activate a row B. And then we need to wait uh, some amount as well. So it's not as large as this refresh uh, latency. We need to wait some, some uh, time. And then uh, we can send our read command. So from beginning to end, from this activation of row A to read, this actually uh, uh, has a direct impact on your access latency, right? if you need to refresh a row before accessing another row. So when we use Hira, what we do is uh, we, we perform an operation that we call Hira. Actually, Hira is the name of the operation. And basically what it does is it sends an activation to row A. Immediately after that, it sends a pre-charge. And then immediately after that, the next cycle, it sends an activation to row B. 
And this whole thing takes around like three nanoseconds. And as a result, with the first activation, row A's refresh operation starts. And with the second activation, row B's activation starts. And at this point, we already have the read command. Uh, we, we can send the read command at this point. And then uh, basically, we, we can pull the read command from here to here, and we can save this much time using Hero. So this is how it works in high level. And in low level, how it works is that uh, this is our DRAM bank, and we have two subarrays that are like far from each other. They do not uh, share any electrical components. And uh, you have a local row buffer within each subarray, and row A is located in the subarray, row B is located in the subarray. You send the activation to row A. So this row A is activated, meaning that this uh, row A in the subarray is connected to the local sense amplifier in its own subarray. And uh, immediately after that, you send a precharge. So uh, when you send this precharge before the activation is completed, uh, this, this rectangle in the bottom is the DRAM bank's IO. Uh, this local row buffer, so you, you interrupt this operation before the local row buffer of this uh, subarray X is connected to DRAM bank's IO. So here basically we only have the uh, row A connected to local row buffer, basically. And it's not connected to the DRAM bank's IO. And then you send another activation. Uh, basically, what this activation does is it just activates this row and then connects this local row buffer to this row. Basically, activation means that. And then uh, connects the local row buffer A to the RAM bank's IO. So uh, just to make something clear that uh, this is a design in our mind. It's, it's a hypothetical design. And... Uh, definitely doesn't mean that this is exactly implemented in this way in the off-the-shelf DRAM chips. But with this model, we can explain what we observe in real DRAM chips. So uh, we, we call this sequence of commands, activation, precharge, and activation, HERA. And uh, uh, there are two timing parameters, T1 and T2, uh, based, defining the latency between these two operations, the, these three commands. And then after this activation, you need to wait for uh, a latency value called TRCD. Uh, the long name is row to column delay. This is the latency that you need to wait uh, after activation to the first column access based on the uh, specifications we have today. So there's nothing different uh, than like usual uh, operation here. And uh, at the end, when you precharge uh, your row, Sorry, uh, when, you, when you send a precharge command to your DRAM bank, we observe that both of these rows are uh, disconnected from their local sense amplifiers and the bit lines are precharged accordingly. So uh, this precharge just works as fine. And you can continue doing normal uh, uh, DRAM operations after this as well. So uh, if we check like how much the row A became active, it, 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 it was activated here and it was precharged here. So this is the restoration time that A has. And this is the restoration time that B has. So uh, a large portion of this is already overlapped. And uh, in a way, you basically end up... Uh, so this is not scaled, right? This T1 and T2 is much smaller compared to TRCD. And... Uh, uh, you, you overlap a large portion of this and uh, you, you reduce the latency you use for, uh, you need, you, you reduce the latency that your bank is unavailable due to refresh operation. So as a result, here refreshes row A concurrently with activating row B uh, by issuing this activation precharge and activation commands in quick succession. And this is a picture of the infrastructure that we used at that time. We have uh, an alveo board that is programmed with, it's a SoftMC here, but SoftMC actually, uh, so we, we were using an early version of DRAM Bander at that time, but DRAM Bander was not published yet. So we use SoftMC in, in the publication. And um, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a DRAM module here, uh, compressed with two heaters. 
and there's a temperature sensor that's connected to this temperature controller. And uh, now you set the temperature to temperature controller. It, it has this like feedback loop over there. Sorry. Uh, keeps the temperature stable. And we have a PCA connection to the host interface. So this gives us a fine control over DRAM commands. We can send a command every 1.5 nanoseconds, and we can keep the temperature stable with this error margin. Okay, so uh, this is the set of DRAM chips that we observed that here I can work reliably on. We tested more chips. So all of these are from SK Hynix, actually, uh, if I remember. Um, so this, this module vendor is different. So this is just a PCBs vendor, basically. But if you look at the, uh, the chip identifier here, you can see that uh, the real, uh, you can see the real manufacturer of the chip. And uh, we observed that uh, uh, 56 of the shelf DRAM chips can support HERA. Uh, all of them are from SK Hynix. And we observed that HERA performs a given row's refresh concurrently with activating any of the 32% of the rows. So you want to refresh row A and activate row B. Uh, uh, you can uh, parallelize the refresh operation of row A with activation of any of these like third two persons uh, of the rows in the DRAM bank. So you cannot like pair any row and then do this. And uh, it requires, uh, not it requires, it provides 51.4% reduction in the time span for refresh operations by overlapping the latencies. And by doing so, it effectively reduces the time span for refresh operations, and it provides uh, performance or, uh, uh, benefits. So there's a, a, a extended version in archive with more details about the chips as well. So you can take a look at that. Um, uh, so until this much, it's like uh, the benefits of the Hira operation. So now there's another challenge of using this Hira uh, and implementing it in a memory schedule and scheme, so that it will be effectively used, right? So there are multiple challenges over here. <clears throat> and to address those challenges, we uh, basically propose something called Hira memory controller. So the goal is to leverage Hira's parallelism as much as possible. And the key insight is that um, when we want to pair a row with another row to parallelize this refresh and access, uh, we only have this 30 something percent of the rows that we can pair with, right? So to find that pair, actually, um, you need a time slack uh, to, to find those two rows to pair with. So uh, how memory here MC performs this is that this is a time scale and uh, it generates a refresh request for a given row, row A, and then uh, when this refresh is generated, it is generated with a time slack. So you need to perform the refresh at this point in time. So this is our deadline. And we just like issue that refresh uh, uh, a bit in advance in time with some time slack. And during this time slack, uh, the memory controller basically performs different row activations for serving upcoming memory requests, right? So let's say for the sake of this example that we can parallelize row A with row Z, but not with row X, Z, Y, and T. So these are in two electrically disconnected subarrays, so we can parallelize them. Uh, basically what we do is, oh, wait. Interesting. So there is a great, great version of this uh, timeline here, but you cannot see it. I think in the screen, I can see it on my screen, but yeah, this didn't happen in any other projector before. I need to fix that. So basically what you do is, instead of this activation of row Z, you put here a row A, row Z here. You replace this uh, command. Uh, by doing that, basically you perform like activation per charge activation at that time. So it, it causes this row T to be post, uh, the, this activation to row T to be postponed a little bit, right? Because it takes a little bit more time to perform those two activations here. But uh, since uh, this refresh overhead is overlapped with this activation, uh, later on you don't have to refresh row A, uh, while like in the, in the baseline you would need to refresh row A. 
separately and it makes like all the requests to wait for a very long time. Uh, so you, in the overall, even though you can you end up postponing some commands, in the overall you gain some performance. Uh, your average access latency gets reduced. So here a memory controller uh, basically implements the necessary components to generate each periodic refresh and raw hammer preventive refresh with a deadline. And it buffers each refresh request and performs the refresh request until the deadline. And it finds if it can refresh a DRAM row concurrently with a DRAM access or another refresh. It tries refreshing the DRAM row, a refresh or parallelizing refresh operation with a DRAM access. If it cannot do that, it tries refreshing a DRAM, sorry, parallelizing and refreshing a DRAM row with another refresh operation. If that is also not possible, then it just goes ahead and refreshes the DRAM row when the deadline comes. And there are more details in the full paper, so you can take a look at that. I don't want to make you bored more. Uh, during the last half an hour. Uh, so we have some performance evaluation using Remulator and with a realistic system uh, configuration. So we, uh, this is the result that we get from our experimental characterization that if we set both T1 and T2 to three nanoseconds, we get a full coverage. So we use that uh, as the parameters for HERA. And we test 125 different eight core multi-program workloads from the uh, spec benchmark suite. And we sweep different DRAM chip capacities from two gigabit to 128 gigabit. And uh, we sweep raw hammer threshold from 1024 down to 64 activations. And the minimum, uh, yeah, okay. So to remind you that ro what row hammer threshold is, it's the minimum number of row activations needed to uh, induce the first row hammer bit flip. Okay, so this is the results for periodic refreshes. So uh, on the X axis, we increase the RAM chip capacity from two gigabit to 128 gigabit, and we look at the weighted speed up on the Y axis as the performance metric. And we normalize this, uh, metric to the uh, no refresh baseline. So in 1.0, we do not have any refresh overhead. So we do not refresh any row. Reliability is completely compromised, but it's the ideal case for performance. Um, okay, so this is the no refresh. All the bars are at 1.0. This is the baseline, which is the auto refresh. Uh, and you see that as we go to 128 gigabit, uh, Okay, this is like the y-axis start from 0 0.7, right? So this is like not too much actually, but it's, it's, it's something significant. 26% slowdown uh, uh, is caused by uh, the auto refresh. And when we replace this auto refresh with hero operations, we can, we still have some performance overhead compared to the ideal case, no refresh, but uh, compared to baseline, we can provide some speed up by 12.6%. And this is the result for preventive refreshes. So here we scale the uh, raw hammer threshold from 1000 to 64. And uh, this time the performance metric is again weighted speed up, but normalized to the no defense, which is again ideal. So you do not implement any raw hammer mitigation mechanism. So uh, your system is completely open for raw hammer attacks. They can, they like, there's nothing stopping them. Uh, but it's the best thing for uh, performance. So no defense has the met, uh, value at 1.0. And when we do para, para, we choose para here because this is the raw hammer defense with the lowest hardware overhead when you scale down to these kind of uh, raw hammer thresholds. All others uh, come with really large uh, hardware complexity. So we chose para for this. Uh, uh, evaluation. And uh, para causes around like 96% slowdown when you reach to 64 activation raw hammer threshold. And when we do uh, uh, perform para's preventive refresh operations using HERA, <coughs> we can reduce this performance degradation significantly. It's still terrible here if you compare the ideal case but it provides 3.7x speed up on top of uh, para. Okay, so we have more analyses in the paper. We, look at, we provide 
uh, full-fledged characterization of real DRAM chips. We verify HERAS functionality and uh, uh, we also show the variation of HERAS characteristics across banks. Uh, we provide some sensitivity analysis to the length of the time select for refresh and number of channels and number of ranks. And we analyze the hardware complexity we need for <coughs> HERAS memory controller. And we show that it's, it's quite cheap, actually. It's just like this much percentage of the chip area you need. And it does not require any, it does not incur any uh, additional latency on the memory request because everything is parallelized. And uh, we also give more details about uh, experimental methods. You can find the algorithms that we used for these uh, real chip experiments. Uh, you can go try those in, uh, uh, in other chips uh, by yourself. Uh, it's based on like DRAM Bander, so you can just download DRAM Bander. You need to find an FPGA setup, but as I said earlier, we have many of them. You can, you're welcome to use them. And uh, we also provide an extensive security analysis of Rohan Preventer refreshes. We revisit actually para security analysis. We fix a little bit uh, of the corner cases. Uh, so now uh, there's a more... Uh, uh, a comprehensive security analysis here. Okay, uh, and we also find a detailed algorithm of how we find concurrent refreshes. Okay, it's a full paper. Conclusion, we propose HERA, hidden row activation in DRAM operation. It is the first technique that refreshes a DRAM row concurrently with activating another row in the off-the-shelf DRAM chips. So the, so the other paper that I mentioned that was published earlier uh, by Kevin Chang is uh, proposing to leverage the same parallelism that we have across subarrays to perform this operation exactly. So in that sense, Hero is not new, but Hero is the first paper that uh, shows that you can do that parallelism, you can leverage that parallelism in off-the-shelf DRAM chips. Uh, so um, I guess you can see that uh, you know, how the DRAM chip is capable of doing something, but just because the specification doesn't spe uh, doesn't talk about it or the vendor doesn't provide any guarantee about that, uh, you actually lose a lot of benefits that you can have in real systems. And uh, we, we presented some real DRAM chip experiments on 56 real off-the-shelf DRAM chips that we show that you can perform this HERA. And uh, it provides 51.4% reduction in the time span for refresh operations, both preventive and periodic. And uh, we also provide HERA memory controller. It's a mechanism that leverages HERA uh, to perform refresh requests in parallel. And it provides uh, some significant speed up for both periodic refreshes and Rohan preventive refreshes. Okay, this is the paper. So I can stop here and... Uh, Yet any questions you might have about this paper or parallelism in general? Subarrays? If not, I'll just continue. So uh, I guess this, like with this here, we covered a lot about DRAM leakage and DRAM re refresh uh, today. And uh, uh, this is like pretty much uh, what what the state of the art has uh, at this point. And uh, if you look at some other papers from uh, industry, you can also see that they're talking about some of the problems that we kept talking today. So this is a paper, this is a rare example of uh, collaborations. So this is a paper published collaboratively from Samsung and Intel that uh, Professor Mutlu uh, 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 referred to in some earlier lectures. Uh, if you took the DCA, probably you saw this already. So, um, uh, so one problem is refresh that we keep talking about, right? Another one is TWR. TWR is the right latency, and it's another challenge. But uh, it's it's something really internal to the DRAM cells and DRAM chips. Uh, so there's not much work on. I mean, there's not much work in the public domain, let's say, uh, dealing with TWR. And uh, 
uh, VRT, uh, you remember from the earlier uh, uh, part of this lecture, variable retention time. Uh, these are like uh, really important problems identified by the industry as well. Okay, so uh, this paper basically, uh, this Samsung Intel paper proposed co-architecting controllers and DRAM to enhance DRAM process scaling. And it is some sort of uh, um, uh, obvious direction, in my opinion. Uh, we have many of these problems because of the isolation of responsibilities or the abstraction, obfuscation between the DRAM chip and the memory controllers. So uh, we need to, uh, if you want to fix, uh, overcome these challenges, uh, we really need to go uh, follow some thorough approach, uh, some holistic approach that uh, actually considers every part that, uh, that, that have been collaborating with each other all this time. Okay. So, uh, there's another paper uh, that, uh, or another topic, let's say. This is relevant. This is not about DRAM actually. Uh, this is about flash memory. So you will get a lot of lectures uh, in November, if I remember, uh, about how flash chips work, uh, the challenges in flash chips, the recent advanced ones, all those things. But I will just uh, briefly mention that uh, flash memory, which is considered as a non-volatile memory, also has some data retention characteristics. And there are some challenges over there as well. So what we talked today about data retention time and leakage is not unique to DRAM uh, technology. So uh, some, some of the limitations is, uh, so this is just like some foreshadowing. Um, so uh, it's difficult to, uh, uh, okay, maybe I need to uh, give some background about flash uh, cells as well. So on the right, you see DRAM cell here, right? So you're already quite familiar with this. So in flash memory, we have a different type of cell here. So uh, you can consider like this is a MOSFET, but uh, there is an addition here. So there is a drain source here, basically, and there's a gate here. It's like regular MOSFET uh, for those, right? And uh, you also have a floating gate in the oxide layer here. And what you do is you basically store charge inside this floating gate. Uh, and uh, that identifies if you store a bit of zero or one, and you can have like multiple levels of that, you can store one, more than one bit in one of these. Um, so uh, uh, this is how like flash stores. And uh, as flash chips uh, uh, scales, it's also challenging, you know, the data retention and reliable sensing uh, difficulties get like um, uh, more challenging and challenging every day, basically. And uh, this is because the size reduce, uh, you have like limited capacity here. And th that becomes like more prone to uh, external noise. And uh, you can see some uh, blog posts talking about that as well. Okay, yeah, I was not familiar with this. <laughs> so basically, uh, this blog post talks about some uh, performance degradation uh, for the, uh, uh, depending on the which data you read. So you, you, you store a lot of data inside the flash chip and this, I'm sorry, this is really bothering. Okay. So what they find out is that if you read old files uh, from a flash chip, it's, it's, it's consistently slower than uh, the normal speed. You get a bandwidth of around like 30 megabytes per second, whereas you would expect 500 megabytes per second. And this is a significant degradation. And uh, this is, uh, okay, it's just highlight, yeah. So yeah, this is the question. Why do you think the old data is slower? Any ideas? 
So you keep talking about data retention. You saw you, yeah, go ahead. Trap to at some point. Yeah, so uh, uh, I guess I need to repeat because I'm not, I, I don't want to rely on the microphones now. So uh, you're saying that uh, the, the charge stored in the floating gate can leak as well, right? Yes, that is true. And uh, this is an important problem in flash as well because we do not have actually a periodic refresh in flash, right? It's a non-volatile memory. And if that file is quite old, it, it, it loses charge over time. And then you, you have something called retention loss, right? So this is your flash cell. Your electrons are here and it leaks over time and you can see some retention error. So this is one dominant source of flash memory errors. And uh, uh, the side effect of this is longer read latency. And the reason is that because you need to, uh, uh, so in flash, uh, you have a lot of parity bits, a lot of redundancy, some sophisticated error correction capabilities, and you need to uh, uh, make all these mechanisms work. Uh, to get some reliable reading when you have bit flips. So uh, there's a work that was published in date in 2012 from UKI. Uh, it identifies four types of errors for NAND flash chips. Um, so, uh, and uh, uh, it, 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 it explains like how they're caused by common flash operations. So there are uh, three uh, here. So, there are readers, erasers, programmers, and uh, another type is uh, caused by flash cell losing charge over time, which is retention errors. This is very similar to what DRAM has, right? Uh, actually, this, this is also very similar to what DRAM has. So uh, these read errors are quite interesting, actually. In flash memory as well, when you read some data from some part of the flash memory, you disturb the data in some other part of the flash memory. So does it ring any bell? Does it remind you anything? It's again, read disturbance, right? It's not exactly raw hammer, it's not exactly raw press, but the same idea in, the, in a different, completely different domain. Okay, yeah. For retentioners, whether an error happens depends on required retention time and especially problematic with multi-level cell flush because uh, uh, in, flash, in some flash chips, uh, we want to uh, uh, put the charge level on the floating gate into like four different categories so that we can store like two bits instead of one bit. And, uh, or maybe in some cases like three bits, right? Uh, and in those cases, they are like more prone to this, this kind of errors. Charge uh, leakage can cause more bit flips. Okay, so uh, this is uh, infrastructure again that, that is used for testing non-flash memories. So you have uh, uh, the controller here and the flash chip here, and you have some other controls here basically to make this work. Uh, yeah, this is HAPS52 motherboard. So uh, I'm not sure if we can give access to this. Uh, uh, I'm not fully uh, familiar with uh, the uh, you know protocols about that, uh, but if you're interested in running some non flash tests, I guess you're also welcome. We can do our best to provide you with the uh, necessary infrastructure. So this work from UKI uh, that is published in 2012 uh, shows these like um, the the raw bit error rate for the files that are like. Um, so that, that like, um, okay, let me roll back. So on the x-axis, we have the program erase cycles and a program erase cycle is a way of measuring the time in data retention, so not data retention, in flash chips. And on the y-axis, we see the bit error rate. And uh, we classify the bit error rate here uh, based on the type of the data that we are reading. So if you look at the, uh, files or the data reads that are like old, like three-year-old, one-year-old, 
three month old, three week, three day, right? So you can see that these like top ones are actually uh, quite old and uh, uh, they suspect that these are the retention errors. So robot error rate increases exponentially with program rate cycles, yes. And retention errors are dominant, uh, nine, more than 99% for one year retention time. The retention errors increase with retention time requirement. And uh, I guess this gives you some uh, idea about uh, like how much you need to trust your SSDs, for example, right? Yeah, go ahead. This robot error, is it per bit or per... So it's like here, it's like 10% of all bits or more? No? Yes, I believe so, yes. So this row means like this is the number of bit errors before the error correction. So on top of that, you also uh, implement your error correction mechanisms and these curves go like quite low basically. So you, you wouldn't see actually like uh, one bit out of every 10 bits failing in one year <laughs> otherwise your uh, i mean your computer wouldn't work reliably right yeah but uh, it also tells that you need you shouldn't rely on that too much so i mean unreadable yeah yes <laughs> It's, it's possible that error correction fails after some number of bit error, uh, bit error rate, and then you can have your file corrupted. Yes. To SSD, thank you. So there are some mechanisms. So I maybe I, I created some like false impression. I So there is no refresh uh, similar to what we have in DRAM refresh, right? In DRAM, we refresh every 64 milliseconds. So the retention time is much larger here. And you mostly rely on actually accessing this data. Whenever you access data, you uh, try like refreshing it. You, you, there are like different mechanisms. I don't want to get into detail in this lecture because you will have a full lecture about that uh, sometime soon. And uh, I believe Mohammed will, uh, Mohammed is on the back corner over there. Uh, he will give the uh, his real NAND flash expert, and he will give uh, the lecture in uh, uh, great detail. Uh, but uh, there are there are some mechanisms, some garbage collection mechanisms, for example, mitigate uh, a lot of these errors. So you read from one location, you write to another location, for example, and you have some redundancy as well. Uh, you can exploit that as well. So there there are some uh, works, you know, looking at that. Yeah, I, I hope it answers. <laughs> yes, yes, you will see more. Okay, so this is the full paper again. Uh, error patterns in MLC non-flush memory. Uh, it's it's quite inter an interesting read. Uh, I highly recommend that. So they propose some solutions to the retention errors. Uh, one of them is refresh periodically. <laughs> the other one is... Uh, uh, yeah, change the periodic uh, pe period based on program erase cycle wear out. So you need you don't have to refresh as frequently as the you know at every age of the. So if you if you look at this plot, so your error rate is quite low here. Whereas your as your program erase cycle increases, it increases, right? So maybe in early times of data, you don't have to refresh it very frequently, but you can refresh it more frequently as the program race cycle wear out. And uh, you need to refresh more often at higher P cycles, of course. And uh, yeah, so you can use a combination of in place and remapping based refresh that are, I guess, uh, not obvious at this point, but will be obvious with the uh, more detailed lectures on NAND flash. So yeah, this is the full paper. Please go check that. Um, okay. Oh, this is another one. Okay. So there, there are several papers actually uh, looking at this. Yeah, this is another one. Uh, and it, it was quite hot during like 2012, 13, but it, uh, there are still open uh, research problems over there. So this is another one from 2015 and another from 2018. Uh, yeah, actually, 
uh, Yishin Luo, if I remember, who is in Google now, and Yukai are really like the experts. So you can just search for their names, find the most recent works, and uh, it will give you uh, an overall idea of like what's going on in this field. Um, okay. Yeah, it's just more works, 2018. And there's a complete lecture on flash memory and SSD uh, from last from 2020 from, by Professor Mutlu. But I believe that, so today you can go watch this video, but I believe that if you, uh, after watching this, let's say, don't wait. <laughs> if you are patient enough, uh, sometime in November, you will get uh, 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 a more up-to-date uh, version of this lecture uh, with really cutting edge included. And uh, yeah, we will dig deeper more in this course on uh, the retention failures in uh, NAND flash. And it's just a reminder, good ideas are a dime a dozen, but making them work is oftentimes the real contribution. So uh, yeah. Okay, this is the end of the slides and I have eight more minutes. Uh, do you guys prefer to just leave early <laughs> or ask questions? I can't take any questions now. Are there questions on YouTube? No. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's it then. Uh, Mohammed, do you have any announcements? No. Okay. And don't worry about the paper reviews. You will have time until the end of the semester. Yeah, then that's it. Okay. Thanks for attending and asking questions. I'm happy to talk about all these topics more. Uh, uh, out of the lecture as well. Yeah, you can just like ping me. Uh, uh, you can find my email in the course website. Thanks. Yeah, have a good weekend.